remember. I can't not. I have to go back there. Yeah. Next time, I I want to come. Because it felt like we were above the clouds when we went. Like well, we a lot of times we were. Yeah. The bus ride. Yeah. Like up. Because when you're that high up, sure, you can be above the cloud. Uh, cloud. Right. Yeah. I don't want to go to South America. You do. You should. <laughs> you should go. Oh, it's so amazing. So I can ride in the boats in the jungle. <laughs> That only happens with when Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> it was a service mission, just like you know. I don't know. I I call bullshit on all these service missions. <laughs> what was the service when we what, went? What was the exact purpose of our trip when we went? Because <laughs> I know we did do service at a certain point, but like it was, was several it? folds. So the first mm. thing is, um, you're going to the greatest rainforest in the world, mm. right? So biodiversity studies, mm -hmm. sustainability studies, cultural That's immersion, yeah. cultural immersion. And then um, we did the service uh, nutritional breakfast for the Riverinos. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> With coloring books and everything. Yeah, the school supplies. Did, yeah. we, did we... I feel like I remember giving them like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something. No, I think they had... Did you? I don't remember. They cooked some stuff and... Yeah. I forget exactly what they made, but we helped build the house. It's that bread because br bread is like a delicacy for them. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Mm. Oh, we built the house. Yeah, you were climbing on the raft. <laughs> I ripped off the whole roof, <laughs> and a rat, a jungle rat, jumped on me. Remember? <laughs> or try yeah, he jumped on my arm, and then he was going to jump on my shoulder, and I went like this, and he went like and sailed over the side, and then somebody dropped a two by four on a chicken. Remember? <laughs> It wasn't me, remember. though. It was somebody else. Did you go down there to destroy their village? <laughs> what? Did you go down there to destroy their village? No, no. We just <laughs> tore off the roof because it, it was it was um, degraded, and, and we were doing a service to help this old couple. They were like 80 years old. Yeah, they mm. were really old. Which is old for, you know, living in the jungle. Like, because they're, they're subsistence. They live off the land. Mm. And um, we were helping them. And so they had to prefab, right, the, the uh, roof roof that's woven in sections. So I just tore it down, I just did the demolition part. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to do the weaving or the, you know, construction. But they use over 10 different species of palm trees to construct their homes. Wow. Like every part, like they'll use certain ones for the, for the um, you know, the struts, certain ones for the joists, certain species are good for like the... Um, the lashings, you know, when they tie everything. It's all very mm -hmm. primitive, mm -hmm. but it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I always love looking at that when they're on the islands and they have to use the bamboo to get off the uh, islands. Wait, we went the floating islands. The so the Isle of Uros. Okay, so yeah. we went to Lake Titicaca. This is not in the jungle. This yeah. is in southern Peru, which is in the Andes Mountains. And it's close to the border of Bolivia. And it's separated by Lake Titicaca. So that's the highest navigable lake in the world. And there's a culture there. <laughs> the Uros, Uro, the Isles of Uros. Though. So the Uros people... They live off of this um, water reed, the, tutor, the tortuga root, the tortuga reed, and they do everything with it. Mm -hmm. They make the islands, they, they tie big, like, it almost looks like hay uh, bales, and they lash them together and make yeah. islands. They make their houses out of it. They eat it. <laughs> what else do they do with it? They brush their, their teeth, teeth with it. They do every single thing with yes. this uh, tortuga root. Oh, man. I remember our tour guide said, like, when they have, like, disagreements in the village, they just split the island in half. Yeah, they'll just, like, if their <laughs> next door neighbors are, like, given that they're quarreling, they'll just, like, in the middle of the night, they'll just take a machete and just chop <laughs> the, the, the lashings and, like, let them float free. <laughs> That's a great way to take care of people. But we took we took a ride on the reed boat, remember? Yeah. Yeah, they make yeah. their boats out of the that same stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I'm sure that some service trips actually go there for service. <laughs> but whenever I see service trips, all I see is people going to these places. They what? like I don't know. They use like a I don't know. They build something like with a toothpick, or they show them like, without a toothpick. And yeah. They, and then they like go and water skiing, and it's just. <laughs> I don't know. It depends what how you define service trip. I mean, you could do Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. That's a big time commitment for a service trip, right? Yeah, it's two mm -hmm. years. Right? Yeah, two year commitment. Yeah, but yeah, I do see a lot of people just going for the sake of traveling, and like it's under the guise of trying to give back to the community. But it's like they're just using it's it subversive, as an really. That's <laughs> messed <Yeah>. up. <laughs> I got, and I mean, like some can be good. Like so, you can get. You can get both out of that deal if you're going and you're traveling. Mm -hmm. 
but you're also helping people. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, it's like they go down there and they do like one very, very, very small thing, mm -hmm. and then they're enjoying themselves for like the next week and a half. <laughs> and then on their social media, it'll just be all the photos of them helping from that one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or in the college letter that I write, it's like... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's like the village from, like, marauding piranhas. And... <laughs> oh, that's what... We were... F I was swimming in the river, right? Yeah, the guy's like, oh, swim swimming. here. I get out. She's sitting there with the fishing pole, and, like, I'm, the, I'm swimming, like, over there. And then all of a sudden, she pulls up a piranha on a fishing pole, so I'm swimming in, like, piranha-infested water. I was like, oh, I think I'll get in the boat now, remember? That was crazy. <laughs> Uh, do you remember the dolphins? Like those pink dolphins. Yeah, the pink dolphins. Like they just looked so like gross because they didn't look like normal gray dolphins. They were, yeah, like, they have like big really bulbous heads. They're yeah, like weird. Like weird little jelly type things. And those were the ones that like, like there was like this myth that they would drag people down. Yeah. And like impregnate the women. Yeah. <laughs> so they made a Wild Thornberries episode out of that. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Wait, really? <laughs> Yeah, the pink river dolphins, the Encantada, right? The Botos. Mm. Yes. I did a whole lecture on it. You didn't take notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you came late to those meetings at Sayville High yeah, School. Yeah. Remember, you always came late. So you missed my probably my whole lecture on it. You're getting called out. I don't remember. I had practice. You know what? You're right. Yeah, whatever. She's, she's late to everything. No, but I don't blame you. I mean, Christina should have filled you in. That's true. Blame yeah. Christina. I always want to blame Christina. She's late to everything. No, it's that's not so true. true. Oh, that is so true. I keep a log. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. That's a mistake. <laughs> I think it's I think it's good. Because then when they're like, yeah. I'm never late. And it's like, oh really? I have a whole log here. It's just <laughs> to keep accountability. <laughs> yeah. So in introduce, oh, I guess. Yeah. So <laughs> what are we gonna start? We yeah, we kind of. Oh, decided. can I get a glass of water before we start? Sure. Is that yes. would that be cool? I can go get. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate yeah, it. Is this like too hot for you? We could turn it off. Oh, you can move it back a slight oh, yeah. bit. I would move it back yeah. maybe like four feet, three yeah. feet. That's all. It's fine. I feel like yeah, I'm I'm in a um, like in a interrogation. Interrogate crime interrogation. <laughs> like I did bad Sorry. things. Well, don't trip him when he comes down the stairs. Oh, just watch that. <laughs> That'd be funny, right? She... I think that should be good. All right, cool. Let me just see what it looks like without it. Okay. No, leave it. Leave it on. It's probably okay. good on. Okay. Yeah. Not that I know, but <laughs> I'm just guessing. Yeah, it still looks good. I'll jiggle my keys in front of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm messed up. Make You're sure gonna deafen our listeners. I'm teasing. Um, so you've done this how many times? This 13, is, 14? This is our 14th, I think. Wow. So you're like a professional at this now. No. No. Oh, wow. And I look like hell, right? I probably look like Paul. For Klempt. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. I had to give you this one and me this one to keep the symmetry. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. All right. Um, all right. Welcome to Wolfcast number 14. This is Dr. Michael Baccarello. Hello. He's my um, science research teacher at St. High School East. You've been teaching for how many years now? I've been teaching for a long time, yeah. since the early 90s. Uh -huh. I've started teaching high school mm -hmm. education. Yes. Yeah, so and I taught in Nassau County. I taught in the Belmore Merrick School District. Mm -hmm. And that was my introduction. I was in my early 20s, and then... I got bored with teaching after teaching AP Bio, <laughs> and then I left. I went back for my PhD in, mm -hmm. in biomedical science, and then I've been teaching science research programs since 2002, mm -hmm. so that's 17 years. Wow. And have you been there, <laughs> like, have you been working at East since 2002? Or so when I started, there was no such thing as uh, Sachem High School East, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. there was two high, and this was unique for a large school district because I've gone to a pretty big school district and I've taught in Belmar Merrick, which actually had three high schools. Mm. And I student taught in one and taught in another one in Merrick. Uh, anyway, um, they had Sachem North, which was 11th and 12th graders, and then Sachem South was for 9th and 10th graders. So mm. it was kind of a unique setup that you had a whole high school building that was just ninth and 10th graders. And that's where most of my classes were. Although ninth period, uh, which is the end of the day for research, I have my 11th and 12th graders. So mm -hmm. I would run over the, cut across the field to uh -huh. Sachem North and then 
find a classroom and work with kids, you uh, know. Yeah. I remember there. the Sagamore used to be Sachem South, right? Or was it Samoset. Samoset, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, though those two buildings are yeah. super close to each other. So then the, the school district had a reconfiguration, I think, in 2004. And then they opened up, um, they built a brand new high school, Sachem East. And it was 9 through 12. And then uh, Sachem North got converted to 9 through 12. And then they mm-hmm. sort of split the district down the middle. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. Yeah, so you only knew that. Yeah. I so. only started once it was just Sachem East. <clears throat> right. And the year that I started was the year that things like really started to go downhill. <laughs> was that without, right? Without naming names. Um, yeah, like a lot of our funding got cut my year, I think. Or maybe when I started yeah. freshman year. Was there was really year. good administration when I re- first started. And I had mm-hmm. tons of support for my research program. So mm-hmm. I only know because certain key administrators had left the district. Mm-hmm. And um, my support kind of waned. Like, and, and I guess other programs suffered as well. Some of the arts, arts programs and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then things got really bad, you know, with, with they had some budget issues. And then they ended up closing two, two of the 12 elementary schools and then one of the for middle schools and so they consolidated mm-hmm. now they're kind of back in you know doing better financially <laughs> so they apparently they're supporting research a little better mm-hmm. yeah um so do you see like a direct like sort of relationship between how well students would do um at like competitions and stuff with how much budget and funding oh absolutely have? there's no question about it because mm-hmm. um i only know this because i've been doing this a long time you know i told you 17 years and so um, when, when I first started with research and I had all this kind of support, I really had a lot of support. Then I was able to get a lot of science fair winners. Mm-hmm. Like you'd open up the middle of the program and, and there'd be all these awards. And now it's like, I can barely get any award success. But what's happened is a lot of these, um, other districts have, have taken on and embraced research and, and really gotten behind it where not just high school, but they also have like a middle school research program. Mm-hmm. And we really don't have that at all. Yeah. I mean, kids may, may do like a science fair thing in elementary school and that's it. And then there's nothing. There's a huge gap. So where I bring my ninth graders to science fair, they're starting where a lot of kids are starting maybe in seventh grade. Mm. So they have already a couple of years head start. Yeah. Like yeah. I know in Ward Melville, they actually, it's like <clears throat> competitive to get into science fair. Oh, it's very good. Yes. Yeah, so like a placement exam. So, right. So my research program is non-competitive, meaning mm-hmm. any kid that wants to come. They don't have to be an honor student. They don't need these recommendations. Mm -hmm. But for them, they actually, like you said, they have the very high uh, stringent standards Mm -hmm. to get into the program. And uh, they need the highest recommendation letters. And so they start out, I think, 10th grade. And all they do is um, prep and um, compete at uh, Science Olympiad. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And then 11th, 12th, they either uh, find a university mentor or they can't stay in the program. Man, I so I yeah, that. where for me, I I don't do a lot of my students in universities. Some yeah. a few do, but like mo- the vast majority are doing uh, experiments right in high school lab, mm-hmm. and I don't think you see that really at all at Ward Melville. They're yeah. all university dri- driven projects. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and that just and it varies from from district to district. Every single district across Long Island, whether we're talking Nassau, Suffolk County, or um lesser or more affluent uh, districts, they all support and like structure and do their research programs differently. So what are, what are no the standard? What, what, are, what are the like advantages and disadvantages of having a competitive science research program? Oh, geez. Yeah. I, I think about this often, right? So when we say competitive, that's all about, you know, going to science fairs, submitting to the highest um, competitions like the, used to be Intel Science Talent Search. It used to be Westinghouse years ago. And now it's the Regeneron Science Talent Search. Sachem East just had a, a semifinalist oh, really? this past year. Wow. Yeah, Vincent Zhang. And I haven't had one in, in a lot of years. I had, like, I've had a few at Sachem North and a few at Sachem East. And then I haven't had it in, like, a bunch of years. Um I can run my research program and educate students and give them a fantastic experience and develop lab skills and, and scientific um, skills. I'm training them to be scientists, really, um, and do no competitions at all, mm-hmm. right? Because the highest level of achievement would be like publishing your research in a professional journal or something like that. And that, that kid Vincent Zhang, I mean, it's impressive enough with the science talent search, semifinalist, but he went up to Boston to present his research at a profess- professional um you know, scientific conference, okay. international conference. And so, like, he presented his poster there and talked to a science professor. So that's an even, in, uh, um, should be a higher distinction. It's not, not it isn't always that way. But um, so 
the competition, we, we were talking about this before, the competition, what it does is motivate. Okay, Sachem's very big into sports. Mm -hmm. But can you have the football team practice every day over the summer and, never, you know, practice every day and practice hard, you know, on Saturday, Sunday, you know, and then never have a single uh, football game? Can, would they maintain enthusiasm and interest if they never had one single game to compete in? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like the same thing with the research. But, like, um, that's not the end all and be all. That's not the most important thing. Obviously, I want all my kids to achieve success. Did you, did you win science fairs? Or <laughs> did? No. Yes, you did. You no. did. She won one of the highest achievements, like the most impressive thing I've ever seen. I um, so when I started at Sachem, pretty much, yeah, right away, I started having kids do this extra competition, which is called mm -hmm. the Long Island Brain Bee. And it used to be at um, Southampton College. And then that closed down. And then CW Post... Um, inherited it and it ran there for a number of years and then they stopped sponsoring it now it's held at Hofstra Hofstra opened up a medical school so they, they embraced the brain bee it's uh, sponsored by the Society for Neuroscience and so I had uh, kids in the past who were competitive oh third place winner oh second place winner Shandana comes in <laughs> as a mere freshman brand new little freshman and she takes the whole thing mm -hmm. and she beat out these uh seniors from jericho that were competing oh, and, and, yeah. and placing for several years and then you came swept in and, <laughs> and scooped them and she won <laughs> first place at, was, at the so long strange. island brain bee so she got to go to the national and compete at national brain bee yeah. and that then was I an experience the ball no you didn't <laughs> did. you did very well you did very well oh, you you were nice. you you were respectable at, at I, I'll never forget because she got one answer right that every single other competitor got wrong. Priscillian, do you remember that? Priscillian. Oh man, I don't. Even I, remember. I'll never forget. I don't remember it a was, single other fact because... in the brain beef, <laughs> but I remember that one, Priscillian. It was because it was in the um, the first the first booklet that we had, okay. and it wasn't in the second one. And so would you drop the ball? Why? Because you didn't study the second book? No, no. British publication. No, it's because I. I guess there was a little bit of complacency there, yeah, but there was just more involved in like the gross anatomy and yeah. the histology. That was mm -hmm. what got me. I and, couldn't and do see, the histology. Hofstra, the way they do the brain bee competition, mm -hmm. first of all, yeah. completely different. When she did it, it was so exciting. Um, everybody's sitting in the audience, the parents, the teachers, and, and then the competitors are up front and they pass the mic and they have to answer the question of the the questions <laughs> flashed on the big screen. So everybody's seeing and really witnessing. The way they do it at Hofstra is, is behind closed doors. They make oh, the kids okay. take a paper exam. Oh, then they bring them into the medical um, gross anatomy. And yeah. they show them, oh, here's a real human brain. And they get to, you know, interact. Mm -hmm. And then they give them the histology and, and anatomy oh. uh, practical, like yes. a lab practical. Yeah, yeah. So they do it completely dead. But it's cool. all behind the scenes. Nobody mm -hmm. gets to spectate it. Oh, that's not exciting. Yeah, it's that's, not the same. That really robs it of a lot of... Vision. But then you go back to Nationals, you know, You're Nationals... better prepared is, then because it's it's almost like a little mirror image of Nationals. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I feel like that would that would have worked if it, it also included the audience. But what was even more impressive is not just that you had that great experience and that great success, but then I called on Shandana, I guess a few years ago, and you went on to help mentor Amy Delury, oh, yeah. Who, yeah. who went and placed Brain Bee three years in a row. She didn't get yeah. first place, but yeah. she got like a third place, second place, third place, you know, yeah. three years in a row. And um, you, you helped tutor her I, I only and prepare her. A little bit. But she was really great. She was. She had so much uh, innate enthusiasm for it. And she was just something special. And I saw that she's going to Johns Hopkins now. Not only is she going yeah. to Johns Hopkins, she contacted scientists there, a bunch of them, and she got somebody doing, um, you know, a lab doing Alzheimer's research, and wow. she's going to be doing Alzheimer's research oh like God. right off the get. That's amazing. Yeah. Just and did, that's but you you played a role in that, didn't you? A very very small role. No, you role. played an important role. You, she could have gone in any direction in science. Her ninth grade project was was. Oh yeah. Was, um, was, she wanted to neutralize carbon monoxide. So what yeah. she did was, she, in the laboratory, she generated carbon monoxide. We all passed out. No, we worked in the chemical fume hood. <laughs> and um, she did this whole reaction with like sulfuric acid and Jeez. formic acid, and it formed carbon monoxide. And the fruit flies, you put, you inject it in the vial with fruit flies, they would drop dead in like ten <laughs> seconds. And then she was looking at, oh, can you you know neutralize the carbon monoxide certain ways? And mm. and then so I had her, but then um, that was the year I was split between the two high schools. And then the year after, I wasn't split. I was back to East, yeah, yeah. doing uh, you know full time there. And so I didn't have her as a student anymore. I remember um, you said she wanted to do something with prions, and it was just like so advanced that like you and Dr. Reefer both didn't know what to do. 
I know, and I even taught um, college biochemistry, and I yeah. couldn't, you know, because I don't have a background in that. My my PhD, I did mm -hmm. cancer research, but I focus on uh, histolic, like cell biology and and some molecular biology. But um, to to take on that biochem, and now everything with the computers and bioinformatics, and yeah. Dr. Weaver is more on that than I am because he's younger than I am, and he did a bioinformatics PhD from mm -hmm. Columbia University, so he knows this stuff. That, <laughs> and even him, you know, he he gave her a little bit of uh, advice, but she basically r worked really hard to try to find a mentor, you know, some outside scientist that can mm -hmm. kind of guide, and never could. Nobody had time or was able to to uh, sponsor her, mm -hmm. and so she was really in a bind. And I never do this, but. Um, Dr. Weaver actually helped a couple of my other students um, get a mentor at, at Stone. He actually met him through chess. So Dr. Weaver does the chess club, right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. so what he was able to do was network because of, of the chess you know, society or whatever. Um, this one uh, professor at Stony Brook University, uh, Dr. Um, Tim Duong, his son is like a nine-year-old chess prodigy. <laughs> and so Dr. Weaver met him through through chess and then just, oh, you know, I teach, you know, oh, we got a research project. Oh, you can take high, high school kids? That type of thing. Because it's often very difficult because a lot, a lot of these students, they go to the university lab and they say, oh, I want to work in this lab because I want to be an Intel semifinalist or, you know, a regenerate yeah. scientist. And so that's how I'm saying the competition is not always the most important thing love of science is, is more important and so i was able to like uh, contact dr well and said oh well these two guys i got in your lab are doing well but like i have this kid that's super motivated that's really you know hard working she won't disappoint yeah. and she she really hasn't i oh mean she's God. done amazingly well and she was the only um student from sage in both east and north to actually place at LICEF. Mm -hmm. LICEF is the long Island science engineering fair it's the hardest competition there is because their rules are even more strict than like the international yeah, science and I'm engineering a, I went to yeah. <laughs> what school did, were you from uh, MacArthur oh MacArthur who's your research teacher uh Dr. Friedman um do I, know them? I don't know if I know them maybe if I saw them I would recognize them and what was your project um, God. <laughs> I did something with, uh, I went to like some, uh, professor's lab at Farmingdale and we were looking at how to make the hydrogen fuel cell more efficient. Yeah. What was that? The Indian guy? What was his yes. name? Yes. Yeah. I know who, who yeah. what's his name? Do you remember? Uh, That's no. all right. <laughs> no, I don't remember his name. But I should remember. Yeah. Because he, he did some collaboration at BNL. And I was yeah. doing uh, doing some work at BNL years ago. Um, I did stuff with um, biofuels actually. It's looking at growing like certain like switchgrass that you can use for bioethanol. Yeah, because they were doing other stuff crap. there with like wood chips. And yeah, all kinds of different well, yeah. alternative energy, and it's great stuff. So, what was your impression? Are you are you doing um, that now? Like that's your career <laughs> path? No. Yeah. It's so not my career path. <laughs> um, it's no money in it. Well, th there were a couple of problems. One was doing research in the lab. <laughs> I I really got got no help from him, and also, okay. but yeah, but it was also I didn't get the the type of resources that I actually needed to do it. So one of the problems that we had was for the for, in a hydrogen fuel cell, right? You have like these these plates that get stacked together. Yeah, sure. You know, to like let the I don't know ion channels like through or whatever. Now, they were taking these very, very thin plates and coating it with, like, uh, I forget what Platinum the or... Yeah. PEM. It's proton exchange membrane. Yeah. It's so... Uh -huh. Yeah. So, they were, they were coating it with that. And yeah. they were using this, I think, like, a, a cold gas gun. Because they had to spray it. It was, like, a spray. Yeah, yeah. So, it was, like, cold spraying. Okay. Or, I don't think we did cold spraying. We did a different type of spraying. But what happened was, when you sprayed it, all the um the metal wrinkled mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you obviously can't merge together wrinkled no. plates because you can't get any anything to happen you know for a chemical reaction or actually get the fuel set to work so they needed better instruments and yeah. equipment so at the time i was like all right well maybe we can adjust these parameters on the machine to optimize for well to minimize wrinklage that's what I called it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what to, it is. To, yeah, it's minimize yeah, yeah. wrinklage. So one was I needed to figure out how to measure wrinklage. And two was I needed to do enough trials on this gun to actually figure out the estimated parameters for the machine. They wouldn't let me do the machine at all. 
So the machine <laughs> ran like 10 times and there were like 15 different variables. I'm like, I can't do anything with this. <laughs> well, as long as you recognize that. So in any, no science is perfect, right? So if you, you, a lot of people have hidden variables, right? So you have to recognize all your variables and say, okay, under these conditions, this is all I can do. You can only do a subset, you know? Yeah. But you were discouraged with science because of it. Did you work by yourself or at the high school team? Or? Um, I had one partner, but he ended up dropping out of research. Yes, probably always because, happens. Probably because partner, was... John Donna's partner let her down. Wait, no, Christina. Yeah, no, oh, she let you only down. Only one year. She, she rejoined. <laughs> yeah, well. But I mean... <laughs> she's watching. But I mean, with, right. like, she, she... with like 15 <laughs> parameters, even running it, like you can't do that 10 times. That's no, like, no, no. Not... You have to be <laughs> committed like, night and day, you know. It's the whole Thomas Edison thing. Yeah, you know. but what I would have enjoyed is if I was introduced to doing more applied mathematics for a research project. Yeah. Which I learned that later on, you, I like I could have done, because well, there's a research professor at Stony Brook who took in this person that I worked for who's like the same age as me. He's like a CEO of some startup right now. But... He he did research with him about like topology of you know uh, computers. Oh um, really? Supercomputers mm -hmm, and how mm -hmm. to optimize topology for running parallel jobs on these computers. Interesting. Um, but he takes in high schoolers, so there was a lot of room at Stony Brook for applied math people to come in and do that sort of thing, and that's what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in renewable. Now, energy. what's your what's your uh, major? Uh, well. I'm doing a master's right now at Stony Brook in, in statistics. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing like data science. It's the field. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever, um, there's that SULI program, which is the undergraduate uh, college students can go work at like Brookhaven Laboratory and do research and they have the supercomputers there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I knew they had that, but I also got into research too late. I no, got, you didn't. I did. I did. I, I got, got in later than you. <laughs> Well, I mean, in, in terms of high no, school. No, seriously, I got in later than you. I, I That was after I got my master's in science education. And then I went back and said, okay, I'm doing a PhD in science. Yeah. I got in late in life. But I mean, like in you high, got a big in high head school. Start. Yeah. In high school, I started in like 12th grade. That was oh, that's all right. Better late than never. Um, yeah. Because I, this past year was amazing. I had three kids contact me. Um, one I went to his thesis defense at NYU. That was Billy Marsilia. Because PhD at... Um, doing biochemistry, working on uh, protein uh, tyrosine kinase receptors, which are key if they're mutate, you know, it's part of signal transduction pathway for promoting cancer. So really high level uh, biochemistry stuff. Now he's starting his uh, postdoc lab at Mount Sinai. And then two other students, uh, Beverly Atuka just got her PhD from uh, University of Washington, St. Louis, and she accepted a professorship at um, a university in Colorado doing plant science research. She worked at uh, plant uh, microbe symbiosis. And this third kid was unbelievable because he dropped out of my research program. This was John Schultz. I forget what year. Oh, is that Greg Schultz's brother? Yeah, oh, yeah. He was a drummer and he was in a couple bands. He, and he's like, Dr. V, I love research. I just can't um, devote the time to make it good. Like he, he, he dropped out for sort of the right reason. I, I really, he was one of my like really hardworking and dedicated students. So of course I want him in the program. But he, he made a conscious decision, like, I love research, I'll go back to it later. I was like, okay, whatever. But, and then later on, he actually did. And so I think, I'm not sure, he went to Cortland, he was thinking about maybe science education, but he eventually ended up uh, doing a PhD um, defending at University of New Mexico. And I remember him talking, he wanted to do something with about like tropical medicine and parasitology. So he actually, um, he, I got this email out of the blue from him, and he's like, hey, I just want to thank you, blah, blah, blah. Um, I just completed my PhD at University of New, Me New Mexico in uh, comparative immunology. And now he's starting his postdoctoral um, position at, at UC Santa Barbara or something like that. Oh, like, and so like, that's amazing stuff. Here's a kid who drops out of re and it still benefits him just from having that experience. You know what I'm saying? It, mm -hmm. it really makes you aware of uh, greater possibilities later on in life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I, here I am loving biology, like, and that's what I majored in at Cornell and everything else. And I, I didn't really understand what, what research even was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true in a lot of, um, you know, uh, high school. If there's not a research program, you have no idea what that's all about. Like, I don't know what life is like before research. <laughs> like, how is that even possible? Because it's such a different philosophy from standard education, isn't it? Yeah. It's like you have yeah. to really go out and find your own knowledge. and Well, you have to go out and see what's 
there. Like, what is the knowledge that's out there? You have to compile what is, like, relevant and apply it to some problem that, like, you want to solve. And then, like, you do it all on your own. And it's it's cool to be able to say that, like, oh, like, I discovered this. You have full ownership. Yeah. Yeah. When it's your idea. Mm-hmm. So that's that's another um, quandary that we face. Like, oh well, if they want a successful research program, high school, you know, school district's going to base it on, you know, oh how many um, science talent search winners, how many, you know, these winners. But most science, you learn the most stuff from failure mm-hmm. and stuff that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And the other problem is um, a lot of these judges at the science competition want to hear all this high level science, and that's all university directed work. But the kid doesn't own that project. Yeah. They don't go there with their own hypothesis and, and step in and say, oh, now I'm going to test this theory and develop from scratch. So most of my students at Sachem do a, a project very organically. They come up with their own idea. They do their own literature review. They do their own experimental designs. They do their own setup, their own experiments, their own failures. They have to overcome those obstacles and fail, and then just move on and try to get some data. Remember your quinoa? <laughs> Risa, you love that. You know, she was inspired because we saw in, in the Andes when we did Valley of the Inca in yeah. Peru, and she saw these people subsisting off quinoa, which is this, you know, ancient grain and Italian protein. <laughs> oh, we're going to test this in the lab. And it was a cool project, a I really cool we concept. We tested the regenerate, regenerative yeah, properties it, of it. It was yeah. a nutritional science project, right? Yeah. On what, though? Do you remember your model <laughs> organism? No, not C. elegans. Are you sure? I'm positive. <laughs> No, we it was either lumbricular swarms oh, or it was Drosophila oh, flies. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, do you remember how to count the segments? You yeah. The scalpel and you cut them. And... and then we had that, like, um, we put it on the plate and we attached it to the computer and, like, we were trying to count the segments, but it kept flailing around and, like. You took blurry like... pictures. Yeah, you know yeah. what is super interesting is that the research that we did, I'm doing basically the same research now, like, in terms of the level of it. So, like, one year we, uh, I forgot what it was. we tested like essential oils on the fruit flies, mm-hmm. and we like the the methods that we used are the same methods that I do now. Like you gas the flies, you like dump them out, you count them, and then you kill them, and then you just do it over and over again until you get like data. And you're testing what essential oil? No, no, no. The, what do you for do? this one, we're just doing a saturating genetic screen. Uh, for there's this protein called HTP. Uh, TDP43. What does that do? Um, so it's involved in ALS. Oh, okay. So people who have it and their direct family members who have it have like an abnormal version of it, which causes yeah. like the these cyto- like the cytoplasm in their cells, it causes these granules to develop. And they're trying to see what other proteins are involved. So we're going okay. through every single Okay, they're looking at metabolic gene. pathways. Yeah, yeah. So you're just doing gene knockouts. Gene knockouts for yeah. every single one of the... Yeah, the fruit flies, people don't realize, like, they have good models for uh, human diseases. So ALS, like Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty devastating. But they, I guess they have share the same gene as they do in human... It's the same... Hom- um, homologous gene. Yeah, it's the in, same... In the flies. Like, uh, like, the phenotype is the same. Because yeah. how we test it is that like we do a geo taxis analysis so we dump all the flies we shake them out and then like we see how slowly they crawl because right. it interferes yeah. with their motor ability yes so it's the same it's the yeah. same like symptoms in humans too, right so. well um, one of one of the things i thought <laughs> would be so advantageous for research is that they make computer programming a standard subject mm because I would fail. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm a little technophobic. That's my because I because I can't tell you how useful that would have been. There's so there's so many possibilities that come with programming. Yeah. Things like you know maybe you don't have access to a lab or something like that. Mm-hmm. But you can certainly simulate it. So this is called in silico research, right? In silico, it's all you know computer mm-hmm. chip. And, and, and it's, yeah, also, no. it's also good at calculating, you know, whatever, like, data, I don't know, you collect for, like, other projects. No, you're absolutely making, right. Making models, making a, a complex models. Because the libraries out there for, you know, a lot of these things, they're pretty simple to use. Like, you can just look at a tutorial, and it's pretty straightforward with the tutorial. Yeah. The only thing you would need to get access to actually understanding this tutorial and running it would be to just learn a little bit about programming. In some other class, like learn Java or Python, yeah. Python preferably, that would be easier for people. But yeah. Java is also yeah. you could teach that in high school as well. I learned Basic and Fortran. <sighs> 
this is what Basically, was. Basically, that's an old one. <laughs> that's what, that's <laughs> where I'm coming from. So, no, I grew up in the computer like, primitive age. Yeah, where was it was like, like 64 first, bit, you know. That was one of the first object oriented yeah. programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Programs. So, I learned that. But I just, I didn't have a. Some of my friends really had a head for computers, and they now they're doing that for a living, you know. But I didn't have a head for it, like, whatever. And I like playing video games, I guess. You know, that's fun, but. Um, computers are amazing, um, tool, but it's double-edged sword, like anything. And so the amazing thing, when I started doing research, this, I knew nothing about research. It was my first job out of college. So I get a job as a low-paid lab tech and I'm learning all this molecular bio. I did, uh, um, genetics of human papillomavirus, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was learning, I wasn't getting paid a lot, but I was getting paid to learn all this stuff, which is amazing. And I never forget, uh, this. Uh, so I started at Cornell Medical College, and then I got a job that was better pay close at home. That was amazing. And so that was at LIJ, Long Island Jewish Medical in New Hyde Park. So I was driving out from Nassau County, I lived in, in Uniondale. And um, they were like, oh, in the library, the medical library, they got this amazing thing. It's called Medline. I was like, oh, what's PubMed, Medline? And it was the very first, basically, search engine that was for, you know, using for getting, you know, biomedical research information. It was like this amazing thing. Oh, I don't have to go and climb up to, you know, the book uh, shelves and the book stacks in the library and comb through, you know, the indices of journals to try to find the information. I could just search keywords. It was like amazing. And now Google search is my best friend or Google Scholar, which yeah. I've trained my students to use, you know, to find valid, you know, scientific information. It's like so key. You know, something I found really interesting is that there, I, I do think there is a downside to looking your information up on Google. And the downside is when you get the information from Google, you get it from a bunch of different sources. And that might seem like a good thing. But it's so much easier to understand a topic when you hear one person's whole coherent thought about the topic. Yeah, but what so if when it's you, when you read a some faulty precepts and but, but no i mean like it like let's say at least for me i'm i'm math so maybe it doesn't like apply to other things but if i read one book it's all in there like it's yeah all... science is a little messier i i feel like not that math can't have um you know um controversial uh theorems or whatever but science is was way more um controversial when it comes to mm -hmm. just like information and i always do this lecture with my students like facts versus beliefs what's more important so everybody's like oh yeah facts are more important than science you know but it's like no you could present somebody a million facts if they have a certain belief system they can just totally dismiss your facts mm -hmm. you know so um it's true what you're saying but um like when you read one book just one book i understand what you're saying yeah yeah thought, yeah you know and that's i think that's like so helpful because then i can at least see their their way of thinking and then you can get someone all someone else's whole way of thinking not part of their thinking because mm -hmm. part of their thinking you can misinterpret well, you know it, and you don't hear like maybe the the intro to the book you're just looking at the one page and then you're like reading it and then taking information from taking information from right. someone else's page but you don't see all the reasons maybe why they came to that point of what they said that's right most of it's like I would almost consider it as like pasteurized knowledge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the, all the other things have been cooked out of it, but you know, that doesn't always mean in science, you know, science is ever changing. And so, you know, today's, you know, great theories, yesterday's like, you know, trash experiments that, you know, they, they have found fault or, you know, new information came to light that completely overrides or dismisses, you know, previous um, beliefs and stuff like that. So this happens all the time. Yeah, so like, for example, I know this is something you bring up always, like, oh, they found st a new study that says coffee makes you live forever. A a another study says coffee makes you die, like, yeah. <laughs> the second you drink it. So how do you, like, for for a lay person, like, how do they deal with the the, the massive influx of, like, contradicting Oh, so that's the thing. Like, if, if you're doing a literature search, right, you could find a journal article from 10 years ago, 100 years ago, and you're going to say, well, you know, the most reliable information is the most recent because this is based off of the best technology, the best, you know, computer modeling, the best science. Mm. Some knowledge, you know, published, look at, you know, Watson Crick, you know, model of DNA that was published, uh, you know, 60, almost 60 years ago, whatever. And so that, that information is not bad. You know, so some information doesn't go out of date and some goes out of date very quickly. Mm. And so I know this from suffering from migraines from any and the big country oh caffeine you know can cure a migraine oh caffeine causes a migraine you know and there's so many and they go back and forth and caffeine is good for you caffeine is bad for you so every other day i'm drinking a cup of coffee to kill me or to improve my health like it's just 
it yeah. changes from day to day, right? And so, you know, certainly we, we base it off a lot of animal models. It's easier to do that kind of research compared to human trials, right? But obviously, um, the biochemistry, even the, from person to person, they all have different biochemistries. Mm -hmm. So maybe what's a, a good dose of caffeine for one person will make another person sick. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. This is where high-level statistics comes into play mm -hmm. <laughs> to help you discern what's right and what's wrong, yeah. which is scary to me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm just being brutally <laughs> honest. <laughs> it's okay. No, statistics is a hard subject. No, it is. Yeah. Because even, I don't know, even like doing your master's in it, it's just... It, it it messes with your head every single day because you you think you know something and then you just go and you do something else. Probably like probability and statistics is the one subject where you feel confident in it and then you get unconfident really fast. So with something <laughs> you can do all of that work without computers, or you, it's computers are integral. Like you oh, have to no, have you computers. Need... You have to have computers. Yeah. Well, but before the advent of computers, when they did high level statistics. I mean, they were still oh, using computers. Like... <laughs> they were still using computers. I mean, you can take it like there was one. There was one thing back in eighteen hundreds. It's called the abacus. No, it's called <laughs> Buffin's Buffin's needle problem. <laughs> and that's a machine. An abacus. You can know that. <laughs> Sorry. Why is the abacus a machine? <laughs> because you can give it instructions and you can maneuver it and it can perform calculations. I was using that as a foot massage. I put it on the floor and I was rubbing my feet on it. And it's really good. It works out like re reflexology. It's the best thing. Um, no, my girlfriend told me that. Margo. I'll give a shout out to Margo in case she ever watches this. Well, what was I saying? Oh. Um, Buffin's problem. Buffin. Buffin's needle, needle. Mm -hmm. So what was interesting about that one was... Ooh, got to have a grid here. So what he did was... It was really weird. He drew a bunch of lines on... Uh, the floor and he took a bunch of needles and he threw them on there and then he used that to estimate pi okay yeah it makes sense <laughs> no it makes perfect sense because it's like the way the needles yes, would land i get it i get what you're saying sure and all the randomness about yeah. it but that was hand calculations he was sitting there counting the number of needles that crossed a line and you know was you know, calculating some statistic. And then I might like that experiment. Pie. Unless the needles, of course, had some um, magnetic field and then they, they yeah, pointed and north oh, and wow. skewed his pie, pie um, and he would calculation. Never know. Well, I mean, if he did a statistical test, you would know. Oh. Or, or had a strong magnet in his pocket or something. <laughs> it could have messed him up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, those were hand calculations, but it's nowhere near what we're doing today in terms of like, you know, very concrete data like the physics experiments that are going on at you know bnl you're not you're not hand calculating that you know you oh have, no you have like you, you really have to have information a, not only events understanding mathematics but the, the computer technology and like the stuff you're doing is like so a lot of scientists hire professional statisticians to crunch their numbers yeah that's just how it is yeah they get you know they need part of their funding for you know doing yeah i mean our, it's a whole separate thing our statistics yeah. department is very involved with the biology department for biostatistics. Yes. That's like one side of our statistics mm. side. The other side is like Markov decision processes and other things like that. But a lot of it is like biostatistics that they do. Um, yeah. Well, what was I talking about? <laughs> um, so like with all of that, like it, it just makes me really appreciative of the kind of experiments they would do back in the day, like before the advent of like, yeah. you know, technology. Mm. How were they still able to like, I don't know, do very rigorous level of science with just the barest of tools? Like, Well, yeah, like the, the one thing with the method of exhaustion where I think it was Pascal, he was calculating the, he was, I think he was calculating pi or the area of a circle. And he was just sitting there drawing, like, N polygons, like, inscribed into the circle and then um, yeah. circumscribed. And then was, like, calculating the area of that. And he just kept doing it and doing it and doing it until he got all the way down to, like, pi and was like, oh, this doesn't change. But, yeah, these people were sitting there for, like, hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. No question about like, it. I feel like when it comes to, like, medical research, it just becomes, like, gory and, like, very... It sounds like medieval torture almost because, like, the way they used to do, the way they used to get rid of, like, breast cancer used to be 
just they would remove like everything like they would take out the lymph nodes like just scrape even parts of like the rib cage out because they were like oh like because from what they understood was that like yes it metastasizes but right like, um if we just like go in and destroy everything like we should get rid of all of it right but like it's just so gory and gruesome to right. think about it now. Exactly. And and they were doing a huge disservice because I know this, it wasn't part of my um, cancer thesis, but it was um, an important landmark study that came out that said if you you do have metastases and you remove the, the large mass, like the primary tumor, mm. then um, the primary tumor is actually making... Uh, inhibitory molecules that limits the growth of the metastases wow. so if you if you cut out the primary tumor that allows the uh those uh metastasized uh nested cells to like get out of control and they don't normally they don't have the normal checks and and um bounds that they would have on them and so they start to uh grow prolifically wow. and that's very you know that's when it becomes really life-threatening mm -hmm. yeah. yeah do you do you ever in it considering you're both in biology do you ever feel like your field is ever, I don't know, in question where it's like you can say something's a fact, but then like just nobody believes you that it's a fact? Um, like, what do you mean? Like, if if one scientist was like working on this like project really manically and they produce something and no one believes him? Well, when when does something become really solidified in oh. biology? Because like physics, it's you know they have something that happens like okay we detect it it is there mm -hmm. you know this is a real thing and we need to account for it we need to readjust our theories so that this can make sense so what is it like for you know biology like where's the where, what are the big theories coherent theories in biology because I, I don't know what they are the central dogma <laughs> the central dogma of biology <laughs> so yeah i mean you know it's it's a i've been studying biology my whole life so when I was in high school, I was most impressed with like learning about genetics. And this was in the early 80s, I guess, with, you know, all this biotechnology stuff was new. And they would just go, oh, we can have these enzymes that could cut DNA and then we can splice and rearrange DNA. And that, oh, the code is universal, right? This is central dogma, right? Yeah. That the, the, uh, the, the genetic code is universal. And so the DNA is just information molecule. It's going to make messenger RNA. And that codes for amino acid sequence, which makes proteins, which, which is the basic scaffolding of living things. It's more complicated. <laughs> so this was the heart of genetics. It's like, okay, we understand genetics. Now let's go after, um, we can do gene therapy and cure, you know, human genetic illnesses. We can, you know, um, modify food to make it more nutritious and do all these things, but that, none of that is being done really today. So the whole field of genetic modification is very controversial, and um, it's not being done with the um, best interests of humanity in mind, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the field of genetics, like at one time I was, I was publishing uh, high-level genetics, uh, you know, studying uh, the mapping the origin of replication of human papillomavirus type 11 and all this thing. And now I feel like I hardly know anything about genetics because all these new discoveries. And this was true even when I was doing my PhD in, in uh, cancer. I was doing more uh, cell and tissue interaction and looking at, um, you know, biomarkers. But I was also considering a lot of these tumor genes like oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes. But now there's a whole new field. It was actually discovered from uh, Columbia University professors on petunias, purple petunias. And they saw these white stripes and they discovered this iRNA, this interfering RNA. And so this uh, led to a whole explosion and a whole new area of, of oh. genetics called epigenetics. What do, you, what do you mean interfering RNA? So what it is is this, okay? The central dogma says you have a gene, the DNA code, you make a, you know, a template copy for messenger RNA that goes to the ribosome, and then transfer RNA brings the amino acids, you make amino acids, it makes protein. Okay? So that's, this is the crux of what genetics and living things are all about. Interfering RNA says DNA doesn't have to code for messenger RNA. DNA can code for sequences of RNA that actually go and bind to messenger RNA causing double-stranded RNA and neutralizing. So it's a different way of turning genes on and off besides just uh, transcribing you know, from, the, um, from the chromatin sequence of DNA. And so it's a whole different feel. And then there's other modifications that can happen to either the chromosome or DNA directly. It could be methylated, and then that can um, influence. It's basically like on-off switches. 
And so people think, oh, well, you know, you need, a, you know, a gene mutation in order to cause this illness, a cancer, whatever. But that may not be so. It might be changes to the other parts of, of the uh, genome that regulate, um, you know, the, the regulation of turning genes on and off. So you may not see an obvious mutation, and yet you have, um, you know, some faulty pathway. And so th there's a whole nother layer of complexity. And this wasn't... Um, even even in my realm of consciousness when I was doing my PhD because mm -hmm. we didn't know so what you know we don't know what we don't know right so yeah. <laughs> and then now and, and I could look back and reflect and say damn you know like if, if I had done my PhD knowing about like epigenetics like my whole course of study my whole like the way I conducted experiment or thought about it or theorized and designed experiment might have been completely different you know in, in light of that and so it's hard to know, like hindsight, you know. So we talk about like, you know, history and science. Yeah, I mean, um, it's not just like the technology has gotten better and, and led us to like doing better science. Um, our whole, I guess, thought process has to evolve over time with with changing theories and things like that. And that doesn't mean we have everything right either, you know. Like I said, oh, you know, my perspective, oh, you know, cancer was all about oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, and okay, some, you know, DNA repair genes also, and some genes that, you know, telomerase gene, whatever. Now it's like there's whole nother levels of complexity that could play into, like, you know, affecting, you know, whether somebody develops, like, a tumor or cancer yeah. or whatever, you know. And so it just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And so how do you how do you handle that? Like you go back, it's like yeah, yeah, it's tough. And and what's scary now is like they don't. I don't think the scientists have a full understanding of all this epigenetics and the regulatory mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But they're forging ahead with this uh, next generation of gene splicing, which is this CRISPR technology, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's like oh, we can make these huge advances, uh, you know, knock in genes, knock out genes, and gene rearrangement, but fundamentally we don't even understand like the all the pieces and, and how they, they interact so, so so it gets a little scary I think so do you advocate for then like fun, more fundamental research versus like <sighs> no you need both you need here? both because the applied science that's what's going to help um, you know get the interest of investors and get the money right because money talks like, like mm -hmm. all that uh, but you need you know a, you know a heavy amount of basic science which is just mm -hmm. fundamental like you know fact finding and, and knowledge you know, building. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I always put into question when it comes to science, yeah, it's just scientific fields, is their their entire basis. So physics, for instance, you know, they have all these advances. And, and it's like, it's true. You can ignore the fundamental axioms of your subject and whether or not they're true. And you can kind of forge ahead and, you know, start, you know, building particle accelerators and stuff like that. Or, you know, doing CRISPR or whatever. But then you have to come to the question, it's like, all right, well, what are we basing all of this on? Like, what, is our, what are our ground axiomatic so, right. facts? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always question is, even the definition of a living thing, like, of what that is, is under dispute. You know, because people are like, oh, well, is a virus living? Is this living? It's I like could it? answer that question. Do <laughs> you want to know the answer? Yeah, please. So, and I asked, I remember asking a professor at, at Cornell when I was a dumb, you know, uh, junior student there and knew nothing about nothing. It's like, is a virus living? And, you know, he said, well, you know, because it has genetic information, but no, a virus is not living. It has no metabolism. The only time a virus can be considered living is when it hijacks a host cell. So, a, a Virus is an obligate parasite. It needs to get its DNA into the nucleus and hijack the cell. Or if it, you have a virus that infect bacteria, right? I work with them in, in the high school lab. So, no, the virus has to get inject its DNA, get it into the genome of its host, and then it sort of be, can be considered alive because then it's able to replicate itself, right? Reproduction is a big part of, like, so, surviving and not uh, ex going extinct, right? So, so it's, like, partially alive? Yeah. That's what I would say. It would be alive when it's mm. when it's actually um, infecting and and um, having an effect on a host. So, Otherwise, when it's just a virus particle, it's kind of like in suspended animation. But it's not wouldn't be considered alive. Like there's no metabolism there. So is it? So is the basic unit? So like when I when I say like all right, what's the basic unit of a living thing? We would say a cell, right? But then if a virus is partially living. But it's not based on a cell. It would be 
the virus expressing itself in a host cell, so it's hijacking it. And then for that time, it's in the cell. I think what he's trying to get at, like, I know what you're saying, like, what is the simplest unit of... Like, so the simplest thing of what organism. would be considered biologic would be um, the unit of life is a living cell. But a virus is not a living cell. No. But then once it goes into it, it's living, but it's not made of a living cell. It's incorporated itself into a host cell. So it's inside yeah. a living cell. So at so that stage of its life so cycle, it's, it could be considered alive because it's, it's you know... So it's living, but it's lower than the most basic unit of life. Yeah, like that in itself is not something that can live right. on its own. Because what's considered living cell, you have energy exchange, right? Cells got to think of amoeba or think of you. You take in food, you get eliminate waste, right? So that's en And then you produce energy from, from that. And a virus doesn't do that. It doesn't have its own energy or metabolism. Yeah. But if it's if it's like living inside the cell, then wouldn't that make the virus the most basic unit? But it's not it, because so, you can't separate. Yeah. No, I I see where you're getting at because um, <laughs> there are sections of your genome called jumping genes or selfish genes Transpose. and transposons. Yes, you're very astute student. <laughs> so transposons, all they do is copy themselves and then they can insert themselves and spread and, and make multiple, you know, tandem copies and do all these crazy things. They think that they're not sure why this happens, but they call them selfish genes because the, the genes are only interested in making more of their own sequence copy and then reproducing themselves. Mm -hmm. So is that a form of life? Like, right? And, and it's just one single molecule? Yeah. A chemical code, and that's a form of life? Because I always tell students, like, DNA doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It's acted upon... And then things happen. But all it's doing, it's like an information book. It's like, okay, I'm going to build it's like this. like a ledger. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make this custom built, like, hot rod car. Like, I need this big manual on how to, like, put put all the pieces mm -hmm. together. So it's, it's a big instruction manual. Yeah. But if it's closed, nothing's going to happen. Right? It has to be opened, and then information has to be derived and acted upon to make things happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always interested in the fundamentals of all the different fields. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing with biology, you know, people, we learn biology, you take AP, you took AP Bio, I'm yeah. sure you got a five on the... No, yeah. actually, oh, I actually got a four. Who's your teacher? <laughs> I had Brink. <laughs> yeah, that's why. You would have got a five if you had Weaver, I know it. That's okay, there's a lot of controversy with that. But anyway, okay. um, no, you're a good student, but like, again... Um, we're learning things like this is fact, this is fact, this is fact. This, when in fact, it's not really. We don't know so much. Like there's so much we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so if I teach kids anything, it's that you have to sort of be responsible for your own education. You can't just say, oh, I didn't learn this because my teacher sucked or this or that. So you shouldn't blame Mr. Brink why you didn't get a five. That's so <laughs> mean. I hope he watches this and comes after you. <laughs> But but the point is that we learn things as fact when really, 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 you know, we can come back like, oh, build a time machine, go, you know, 100 years into the future and see like completely different face of things. Yeah. You know, like I think of pr biology, like primitive, like, you know, Van Leeuwenhoek looking through the first cell. And, oh, that's cork cell. And, he's, you know, oh, it looks like a prison cell. I'll name it a cell. Like, you know, and then we've gotten so so advanced well, with electron microscope and, and all this molecular probing where you could, you know, custom genetically engineer like an amoeba and watch it do fancy flips or something, you know. And so we have to reflect on that. Yeah, it's always good to think about like the uh, historical context like you, you alluded to earlier um, with science um, because the technology where it takes us in the future <laughs> Sometimes it may have, we think, oh, this is great, the technology is always wonderful, better living through technology, but sometimes it doesn't always have the best interest for everybody or, or humanity or nature or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very cautious. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it's good, it's good to look at the fundamentals and try to philosophize about it. However, I don't think it's useful to say, to stay stuck and trying to get the fundamentals because it's like Otherwise, well well like well like real I mean like really nailing it down to a board of what you know the 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 axiom of your fields are because in essence 
all models are wrong, and you can still go ahead with a pretty good model. And obviously, you need to get yeah. it somewhere. <laughs> so ultimately, you say, well, this is based, you know, the science, this theory is based on so this fact, this fact, this fact. But ultimately, when you when you break it all down to the beginning, it's going to be based off a of belief. Yeah. Right? Ultimately. Yeah. And so this is a whole argument, facts versus beliefs. So both are important, but like in science, you always want to like get the best, um, you know, sound facts. Yeah. And that only comes through like arduous experiments and, and uh, controversy and debates and scientific argument. And this happens constantly, but it makes the science stronger through argument and not everybody having a consensus view. Yeah. Yeah, because um, some, some very important discoveries or theories may be, like, totally neglected only because it doesn't fit into the standard oh, model. Yeah, I was going to say, so what, do you, what do you think about all of the scientific paradigms that have occurred and scientists' resistance to look at the facts mm. once it starts yeah. crushing their world belief? Yeah, the arrogance of ignorance, right? So, yeah. no, they say, well, I'm an expert. I've been studying this my whole life. I'm so smart and everything. So it's more of an ego issue, really, than it is any kind of, um, when I talk about like evolution of science and science being ever-changing and, and evolving. So you don't just, you know, grab onto every like wacky theory coming down the pipeline. But again, like if it doesn't, if, if some radical uh, discovery changes, you know, the, a paradigm shift, um, it's going to be met with uh, outright, you know, hostility. Yeah. Right? Because people don't want their worldview disrupted. You know, or or, or, the or they're, they're done. yeah. I'm I'm the expert in this field. You're not going to come and, and tell me that I was wrong and and you have a better theory. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's going to want to hear that. You know, so yeah. So it's more of a, of um issue when it comes to like you know somebody's ego than it does like doing what's in the best interest of of open minded science. Yeah. So I tell the kids you have to be both um as a scientist you have to be you have to be critical. So, and self-critical, you have to be pessimist and also optimistic. So you have to be both critical of all ideas, but then open to, you know, other. Yeah, you don't weird want to be close-minded with. Yeah, you can't be the ideas, especially because you know it, it really comes down. As much as scientists, you know, you want you want to have the worldview that I look at facts, and when the data comes in, that the data tells me what's right. Then the data comes in, and it's not in your favor, and then you find out how hard it is actually to change what you're thinking, even though your belief is to find out the facts through the yeah. data. But it's like it's such a human part of you that's like, no. <laughs> well, you go for a no. peer, peer <laughs> review process and they say, oh, you know, you had this, you know, experiment and you, you got this data and you believe it, but like, oh, you you didn't consider this variable or whatever, or, oh, you didn't run this statistical model. Now go back and, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, and it completely disrupts your whole whole being it's like you know you know because you put so much time and energy and thinking you're right you know and then to find out oh well no there's a better way of doing things or a more correct uh, procedure for for getting um factual information so it's very difficult mm -hmm. it's it's not trivial mm -hmm. yeah are there is there anything like that right now where there's like a someone who's like really eminent in their field and like has a huge ego and is stopping like real progress from being made. Oh, geez, I guess it it it's pervade like it happens pretty much in in probably all areas of science. Mm -hmm. And I I just know like I'm thinking about because I'm reading this book I got from my public library, mm -hmm. um, and it's called The Myth of Man, and they're talking about like all this um, you know, the ancient megalithic sites, and it's like. Well, you know, standard archaeology says it was built, you know, within the last 500 years. And then we look at these things and there's other evidence that states, no, it's way more ancient than we could ever believe. And it's just the last rem. You saw it for yourself when we went to Valley of the Inca. Yeah. Those megalithic stones like God, Oyotatambo. They were like those two tons. Each. No, they were like 200 tons. They were massive. And they were somehow they cut it from a quarry. They moved it down a steep, um, like, valley ravine across a, a torrent of a river, right? And then up a, a steep other mountainside and placed it and then um perfectly they were mortise there was, there was no mortar there was no mortar you couldn't even yeah. stick a piece of paper and they were giant giant boulders it's like ridiculous it's like how did they do that did you did you ever see um like the new theories that they're coming out with um it actually has to do with the amazon um i was watching joe rogan i don't know if you ever watched joe rogan experience <laughs> um a, i don't know if i've ever seen it yeah but he had this um archaeologist guy on or he was 
a really like intense author about archaeology. But what they were finding was one was they found like I think genetic material from or DNA from someone that was from Polynesia and they found it in the Amazon. Yeah, and this, absolutely. And this was I think before or during the Ice Age. And one of the things was they know it couldn't not th these people couldn't have already been there coming from right. through North America because you know, the the land bridge, there was like a giant barrier. You couldn't cross it. So they were thinking that Polynesians started sailing way before right. they thought they did. Yep. And they actually sailed across and went into the Amazon so this, and yeah. introduced these people and made all these city structures yeah. everywhere. And upset a lot of historians and archaeologists, right? Yeah, it upset Cause, everybody because everyone's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, just, <laughs> they were dismissed it because this is not what the experts tell us, but... But yeah, new information, and like you said, they were back then they didn't have all this where they could do the DNA typing and you know, tracing you know, mitochondrial leave, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, the technology has taken it to a whole different level, mm -hmm. right? Same, same thing with the, the Sphinx enclosure, they found that that was there was erosion from water because there was some water global erosion. like cata, cataclysmic event. And they found water erosion there, and the water erosion was like way older than the, what they were predicting for this you know, right. the Sphinx's age. Right, like because if, like the if that years flood older. happened, you know, the Sphinx was supposed to be built like tens of thousands of years before that, like yeah. later than that, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, "Oh my God, the Sphinx is way older than we ever thought conceivable." And it's like. Well, this high society, what was it doing back then? They're supposed to be cave cavemen, you know, you know, with clubs and, you know, hammering rocks and that's it. Yeah. You know. It's it's insane. So so yeah, so like I said, I think there's huge when they, they find these anomalies and you have these people, oh, you're just a radical, you know, conspiracy theorist and stuff like that. Because mainstream archaeologists, it's like, look, you're not gonna get a, a university professorship if, if you're gonna just spout out these wild theories, you know. And so it's almost like they're pigeonholed or forced into a consensus view. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you have to play along with the rules that are set. Otherwise, you're not going to be part of this, yeah. this special group. Think about how many textbooks go to garbage. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's <laughs> insane. Yeah, it's like, so true. And, so true. And, and there's not but even like a theory. But is that a necessary process for the evolution of knowledge that, that textbooks mm -hmm. have to be thrown in the garbage? Nowadays, we don't even have to print textbooks if we just read, pull up on the computer screen and just edit on the fly. Isn't that Wikipedia? We yeah. can do that. <laughs> like a, a constantly edited and yeah. updated uh, source of knowledge. But that, that like messes... Hi, Google. <laughs> <laughs> Control that, my life. <laughs> that, messes, that messes it up like so much. Cause it's not like it's like figure if like you were like doing biology and you were like oh we were wrong from the start. <laughs> yeah, like I <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> it's true, but you yeah. have to start somewhere. That's the whole point. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody in that community is happy. <laughs> no. About that, and plus it seems to be these a bunch of different little things adding up. You know, because they, they I think they also found all of those. Ah. Uh, what were those people called before, like, um, Homo oh, erectus? Uh, Homo Australia. habilis, Australopithecus. Uh, yeah, that one. That one. They yeah, found, like, a Homo whole, habilis. like, cave yeah. of, like, all of, like, their bones and stuff. And they figured out that they were, like, a little bit more advanced than they also thought. Wow. I wish I could just take a time machine and go back and see, like, every stage of <laughs> the Earth's evolution. Where would you go back? That would be amazing. Time? Oh, uh, Cambrian explosion, that's uh, 500 million years ago. So that was the first evidence uh, that we have of uh, all these uh, diverse phyla of uh, living animals, right? Because um, there was a Harvard professor, I forget his name, Whittington, or he was, he was um, you know, hiking up in the Canadian Rockies, and he came across, you know, fossils of shells and stuff. And so they inspected it further, and they found the whole huge explosion of fauna from, like, from earlier rock levels where you see basically nothing, because the first living amoebas or jellyfish, they're not going to preserve in the fossil record, right? But then you find this explosion of, like, hard shell organisms. And, and I guess the way the sediment, they even got some of the soft parts, too, pre well preserved. But they see even phyla that, like, were on this earth and went extinct that no longer exist. But all the major existing phyla that we, we recognize today for animals well, were in existence in this. And so that was dramatic to see that. 
But then, you know, the conditions might have been uh, not survivable for us. They could have been for those organisms living in the ocean, but maybe the atmosphere wasn't uh, conducive towards, you know, our survival. Could have been too much radiation or not enough oxygen, whatever. And we've, we've known that, like, oxygen levels have, and CO2 level, everything has fluctuated wildly. Temperatures, the snowball earth, they, they, you know. So there's been, what, five mass extinctions, and we're going through the sixth mass extinction that's, <laughs> anth uh, you know, anthropogenically um, induced, that's hum human-induced, right? <laughs> Loss of habitat, species, you know, are going extinct at alarming rate across the planet. So, um, no, I wouldn't want to go back to the dinosaurs, man. I would want to, <laughs> I would want to check out the dinosaurs. <laughs> But even more interesting than the di dinosaurs was uh, the Permian Age, where you had all these uh, rapid evolution of, of uh, tetrapods, you know, uh, vertebrate animals on land. So you had these uh, Deinonychus with the, uh, the big sail fin thing. Mm. Not Deinonychus. What was it? Uh, Demetrodon. That's it. Demetrodon with the big sail. And, and so that would be amazing, too. The therapsid. I can see mammals. you're like lassoing a dinosaur. Yeah, no, I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I heard I heard that they their um representations of dinosaurs oh, is yeah. not like correct at yeah, all. Yeah, like aren't velociraptors actually tiny and covered in feathers? So they they you know, if you think about any um um ecosystem like like if you take any like oh, let's think about birds, like most birds are not ostriches, right? Most birds are tiny. Mm -hmm. So obviously dinosaurs were huge, but probably the vast majority, just like mammals, like we think we're so, oh, we're so diverse, you know, people are all over the place, or, you know, we think of like, oh, horses, cows, or whatever, dogs, cats, most mammals are tiny, the most diverse orders of, of mammals are going to be rodents and, and bats, you know, so th those are tiny, they're everywhere, um, we don't think of them as being, you know, dominant, but they're probably more, <laughs> uh, more biomass than them, if, if, if you add them all up, you know, across the globe, um, so yeah, that's true. Uh, it's interesting. Like I read this book called Sapiens. I don't know if you. Okay. Heard. No. Um, they talked about like uh, how humanity evolved from like their very beginnings to like you know present day, and initially when humans first came to like North America, there was apparently like so much megafauna here. And literally, we just killed them all. Like, we, hunting, yeah. overhunting. Wait, that's, or, or made it fun. It's just, like, really So, big. woolly mammoths. Yeah. Like, cavemen, you ah. know, spearing mm. woolly mammoths and, you know, saber-toothed tigers and giant ground sloths. And so, yes, yeah, so we thought um, that humans uh, hunted them to extinction. But who knows if that's 100% true or uh -huh. not. Uh-huh. And so we do have a lot of uh, fossil evidence of that, right? Mm -hmm. They'll find, uh, you know, mammoth bones with uh, cut marks from, like, spears or, you know, flint knives or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and even up in, um, like, the Arctic region, they were using the, um, like, the tusks of the woolly mammoths to make their shelters and stuff like that, you know. And they put the animal hide, so they were using it as, you know, tent poles and stuff. Are, really wild stuff. Are you, are you an alien believer? I peg you for an alien believer. <laughs> um, so... The problem with uh, belief in alien is is this for me. Don't tell me there's problems. As a alien. scientist, <laughs> as a scientist, seeing is believing, or you know, some sort of tactile evidence, right? So where's the smoking gun evidence? Where's the smoking gun evidence? Show me an Area alien. 51. Well, no, no. no. Where's on. the smoking gun evidence? Meaning, I need to see a smoking. I need to see evidence at hand. I need to see an alien. Maybe it's preserved in some, you know, big jar, you know, of formaldehyde. Or I need to see, like, oh, show me. If somebody opens up a garage door and there's a big flying saucer, oh, this is alien technology. So do we have evidence to display that? Do you or there could be aliens that are beyond our level of perception. So if we're talking about alien life, but it's in a different dimension and we can't perceive it with our senses or something like that, um... Does that mean it doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. So if you just do statistical analysis and you do the <laughs> mathematics on this and you look at how many stars in our galaxy, how many stars can support um, a solar system similar to our, or just like be able to have like what they call the Goldilocks planet, like the planet in the right position and the right, you know, condi conditions that could even possibly uh, um, create what we consider like organic life or you know isn't that molecular. Really applicable to our idea of life though what so right so what if life is not carbon based in water what if it's based off of silicon and based off of like liquid ammonia instead of liquid water like so it's only what we can say is life as we know it right mm -hmm. because life how do you define life and I, I said not so much like oh cell cell membrane you know genetic information 
life um, is an exchange of energy. I mean, so the Native Americans believe like everything around you is alive. Even the rocks, they they ha they do. They have molecular vibration. Everything has vibration. I mean, you could you could so, you could think about even take away all the other forms of life, considering we don't know what else could could you know life could be made out of. So just consider carbon and think about well, what are the chances of that and each what's the probability that each planet can sustain it you know giving their distance from whatever yeah, solar system it's a good question and stuff like that mm -hmm. and it's like is that number one because i, I well we're, most, we're not mostly carbon right we're mostly water yeah so wouldn't you say life is water water has consciousness well i would say it's, i would say know. a lot of our a lot of like our moving parts moving parts that make us organisms isn't water no, the hundred percent depends on water. <laughs> it does all life. Isn't it ninety nine point nine percent of the molecules in our bodies are water? No, I don't. I think it's or maybe it's the mass. Maybe something. It's like yeah. over seventy eight percent or something like that. Mm -hmm. We're mostly water. Do you? Do uh, you... But with the carbon, we're carbon scaffold. But the carbon can't act in isolation. It needs water. Like yeah. it's it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. yeah. Um. Do you know Bob Lazar? No, who's that? Oh, you got you got to hear about this guy. So this guy apparently said has claimed, and this was like in 1989, that he was working at Los Alamos okay. Labs, and he was working on alien flight technology uh -huh, uh -huh. that apparently they found there. Um. So obviously everyone called him like you know crazy and stuff okay. like that. Yeah, naturally. Um, but then some of the stuff he was saying back then, like he was talking about things such as the the hand scanners that he had to like use to get into the labs, and there were these biometric you know scanners that looked at the length of your hand because apparently mm -hmm. you know like that's unique to every person. Right. So you would use that to like get into the labs, and everyone was also calling that crazy because they didn't have that kind of technology back then, um, apparently. And then what they found out, they found pictures of those biometric sensors, like, I think, like, this this year or whatever, like, they kind of, like, dug them up. And, you know, these pictures came about, and it was like, all right, well, he said that that was true, right? Yeah, people said he was crazy, dismissed him like a lunatic, but then they found out, like, he but wasn't then, making that up. Well, yeah, that, that at least that part, yeah, right, we right, can right, confirm right, right. he was not making up. But then there were other things, such as they were trying to find out, because he said he went to Caltech, and then he went to MIT for his master's. Now, one is one fact that you like would need to know is he would have had to have gotten an education from somewhere, because the guy's not an idiot. The guy's running a, like a, a lab right now, and he was, at the time, making all of these uh, um, propulsions on his equipment that he had like on mm -hmm, his bike mm -hmm. on his car and stuff right like right that. right right so he said that that is that's after he got out of college that's why they recruited him to this place to work on the propulsion for these like alien things which would line up with what he was doing before mm -hmm, los mm -hmm. alamos labs and then the third thing was one they can't find any records of him at these schools two they called up los alamos labs and they say they have no record of him now on the other side of this is that in a phone book listing the employees that were, you know, working at Los Alamos during that time, he's listed in the phone book. So, but what if there's two people with the same exact name, which is possible? I think they would have found that. Yeah, it it seems very coincidental that yeah. they would be working in the same place. So do we but believe then, him or don't believe him? Well, then, it's, the then, then another thing was they found a newspaper that was talking about his, you know, jet propulsions that mm -hmm, he had mm -hmm. on his car. And in the newspaper, they also said, like, you know, oh, he's, you know, a researcher at Los Alamos Labs. And stuff yeah. like that. Some people could just be have, be prodigy. Like they could be you know, self taught and they can have like special talent and they're just able to do these things without being formally educated, right? That's true. Because we have to be, what is it? Thoreau, he, he made this quote. I'm, I'm going to mess it up. But there was this quote made by Thoreau, you know, philosophy saying that what does education often do? But it makes a straight cut ditch from a meandering stream. So in recent, you know, you always want to question things and ask all these questions and, and imagine things and wonder and use your creativity. But, you know, 
education, you plow ahead and you have to learn these things because this is what you have to do. Like you're, you're forced to do things and not have a choice in the matter. Like research gives you a choice. You could study whatever you want. Yeah. You know. Well, and what was more interesting was what he was actually working on that he claimed to work on. What's that? Which was the propulsion system that he was talking about for like the alien spacecraft. He said that there was a reactor that was like this anti Anti-gravity. gravity gravity reactor and then you know when he what's that based off of like vortex technology I have, or I mean, I would implosion have a, technology because this is a big no idea, and zero is, point energy like there's all these th well, theories but that's, right but that's, so, but that's why he all our technology is based off of um combustion engine what's yeah. combustion everything's exploding yeah. out exploding out exploding out there's there's some theories and i don't know much about this at all so i don't know i shouldn't even but it's implosion technology so you get derived energy from like implosive forces or vortex you know if we can like move space yeah you yeah. can move an object but so you know one of his like lab partners or whatever like when he showed it to him for the first time he's like you know try and put your hand on and he's like it's like i couldn't like put my i couldn't touch it like oh, it was, there was repulsive forces. Was repulsive yes, yes, force. yes. So I thought that that was interesting. But what was more interesting was he came out apparently not for that there was alien technology, but the fact that there was this anti gravity reactor like propulsion system. That's what he came out for because he was mm -hmm. like, you can't keep this from people because this is really important to science, you know, and it's also a very dangerous thing because think about it, if you could actually have something that's anti-gravity you could have force fields around all of your equipment and such you couldn't get hit by anything if you can't touch it you know so sure it's like crazy top stuff. secret <laughs> government secrets or whatever but yeah who knows if he's making it all i don't up. know <laughs> so that's interesting yeah i mean because again um and there could be sort of um disinformation to mislead people from the actual truth like so it's hard to um differentiate fact from fallacy a lot of times, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, but I do believe in aliens. <laughs> cool. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> the ones from Star Trek or for Star Wars? Uh, not Star Wars. Which ones? ones? Definitely not Star Wars. Uh, I, maybe Grays the... or Star Trek? No. I like the one on the Flintstones. <laughs> Kazoo. He had like he was a little green guy. He floated and he had a oh, helmet yeah, with the little the antenna. Little... Did you ever read Ray Bradbury's uh, Dark They Were in Golden Eyed? No, should I? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Okay. But the premise of that is a little different. It's yeah. basically humanity has been able to establish a colony on Mars. Um, but like, uh, in, like similar to how when people establish colonies in the New World, like uh, from England, like those people slowly dissociated the, themselves from the heart, like the the mother colony. Okay. These people, these people who went to Mars are slowly dissociating themselves from the people on Earth. I see. And over time, they... Become a separate species. They become a separate species. Sure. And they become Martians. From geographic isolation. Interesting yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah or, or you could think of aliens could be like... Um, like mind parasites, Ugh. like they could get in, like a virus, right? That's not really living, or according to what we think, but then it could get inside your brain and affect your behavior. I was like Independence Day. Is that how that worked? I didn't see Independence. I know that they were like able the way they communicated. Mind control or oh, okay. yeah, yeah. just through ESP so or they mind control because like, they work yeah. all all in like a hive kind of right. Yeah, but I, I think I think Star Trek is like the most realistic thing oh, that know. looks like it could be in the future. Everybody's I mean, got to be a humanoid. What if it's a complete? Well, I mean, think, of, think about how organized form. their thing is. They have like the, the Federation and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. These, these star it's, fleets. It's like, oh, that sounds exactly like what would happen. No, but that's totally based off of the human model. Like, yeah. uh, what, what makes you think, like, do you see all of the diversity alone in like the number of species that are on Earth? Yeah, but what if we're the first ones that, <laughs> that conquer space? Let's say, like, all right, we, we would maybe say, like, all right, if there is an alien, they got to be smarter than us. Like, what if we are the best thing we got right now? Yeah. And we started all up. be amazing. And, start, human thing to the and, and we start up. The I'm going to call Enterprise. up God and tell him he's fired. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then we go and visit other planets and have them make up stories about you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the power of myth. Isn't, isn't the, um, the theory that a comet carrying, like, all of the essential uh, elements that we that were required for like yeah like crash absolutely into yeah this was proposed and there was a lot of evidence um, supporting it. Mm -hmm. um, 
they have these high flying planes that fly, you know, in the upper, upper, upper atmosphere that could collect, you know, air sample, and they find like living bacteria up there. You could send tardigrades, the little water bears, into space, mm -hmm. you know, zero gravity, you know, vacuum of space, radiation, all this stuff, and they they form like you know a cyst, a protective cocoon, and then they could be reanimated, you know. So there's a lot of evidence that you know there could be organic uh, or what we consider like living cell, like bacteria that could sort of be dormant in the comet mm -hmm. and spread. And this is called panspermia, right? This was proposed by um, uh, Crick, Francis Crick, you know, Watson and Crick DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, so he went on later to you know study more um, other topics in biology and neuroscience. But one of his things was um, this this idea of panspermia that that Earth could have been seeded from life coming from a distant point somewhere else, mm -hmm. maybe even from outside our galaxy. Who knows, right? And so. Um, the real answer is we just don't know. I mean, and people study this. They spend their whole career studying that origins of life. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, but and then, you know, we always learned, oh, it was this chemical soup and you had this, you know, prebiotic soup. The primordial soup. Sounds so delicious, <laughs> this prebiotic soup. But then somehow, you know, complex you know, cells were able to spontaneously form out of that, you know. You, you know what blows my mind? No pun intended. The Big Bang. The Big Bang. <laughs> Because, like, when you think about that, it's like, that's apparently the answer of where everything came from. But then it was like, well, what was there before that? It just came out of nowhere? The whole thing just came so out of you, nowhere? So you're, your conscious entity reflecting on the Big Bang. So where did the Big Bang really came from? No clue. When you were conceived. No. But nobody wants to think about their parents having sex to conceive. That's the Big Bang right there. So I, I don't like the analogy, necessarily. I think that... Um, <laughs> this is the best evidence that physicists have to date, and and a lot of it has to do with do red Doppler shift, right? So the the further out in 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 the um gal in the universe that you're looking, you know, there's this red shift, meaning that things are are spreading a yeah. away from each other. Okay, let's play this. Let's play the tape backwards, and then everything comes together at a single point, singularity. But that's based off of our current understanding and evidence. But what if, like, you know, there's all these theories, oh, the universe is composed of 11 different dimensions, and what? And space-time is warped, according to Einstein. So what if, like, we're not looking, we're looking at this kind of three-dimensionally, and, and the fourth dimension would be time, you know. But there's a lot of uh, physics theories that says time can be, like, factored out of the equations. Time doesn't even exist. So how do we reconcile that? So what I'm saying is probably the the big that's the best theory we have at the time is that to say it could be modified or completely obliterated for some uh, future discoveries. I have no idea, mm -hmm. but it's an interesting idea. Do you think there's multiple universes? Um, multiverse. Our universe is big enough. Where so where would they fit? Like I don't know where would we put them? Uh, or it could, could it be, be tiny like Horton here's a who that's in well, your pocket? Yeah, what you know, they, like, layered, super Yeah, like they like call these brains these layers. Mm -hmm. Planes. Oh, like my brains. Yeah, oh, cool. brains. They call. Oh. My my theory is that the edge of the universe. And we're getting away from science here, people. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? My, my theory is that we're so the what's happening now is they're saying the universe is expanding. So what I think is happening, I think that we are inside a black hole, and since you could. I, I have no idea this, right? I'll just say that the surface of the black hole, I'm not going to say that there's anything in it. All I'm saying is that the density is concentrated at the surface. And if we're inside of it and we're being pulled outwards, we're being pulled outwards towards the edges of the black hole, and on the other side of that black hole are things being pulled into it from the density that's at the surface. So I think that when we explode it's really just going to the edge of black hole but then we have black holes that are in other universes that are pulling things in yeah so <laughs> so there's a lot of theories that say that the black hole exists at the center of every galaxy and then there's other theories that said there's all these like minuscule like nano black holes that are like everywhere wow. or the center of every atom has a black hole you know so i mean there's so many um Theories, but but the problem is, is that how do you go about scientifically to prove? Like when Einstein came out with his radical theories with relativity, <coughs> excuse me, people didn't believe him right off the right off the bat. It took decades for them to design uh, the 
equipment and the technology and the proper controlled experiments that they could prove or disprove him. And once they did those experiments and validated his, his ideas, then they were like blown away. Yeah, what was the scientist's name who detected during the eclipse the bending of the sun's rays? It was like, it started with an E, I think. It's like Eden. Euclid? No. no Ed know. Edin? Or I don't something. Remember. It was like some astronomer that was in uh, that was in uh, England that like went down I think to Australia to mm -hmm. do the experiment to see Solar if the eclipse, so, right. to see if the you know rays were actually mm -hmm. bending around it yeah. so that space time actually had uh, this curvature to it. I think it's Einstein. <laughs> no, but <laughs> there was a, there was an astronomer who went and actually performed. Oh, Andrew to, 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 Cromelin. Cromelin. That's I could have sworn it was an E. Uh, we're talking know. about the total solar eclipse. Uh, they tried to do Eddington. 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 Okay. They tried to do another time in Russia, but then they got caught or, because it was during the war. Oh, okay. And they got caught, and then they were like, yeah, you got to take the stuff out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. What blows my mind is that, like, Everything that we know is just solely based on our perception of it, and our perception is so limited. It's just, mm. like, you can't even see all the forms of light there are. Okay, yeah. Right, the electromagnetic yeah. spectrum going from radio waves, which are, you know, meters long, to, you know, gamma rays, which are, you know, less than a nanometer, you know, in wavelength. And we only see a narrow, narrow band, that's our vision, Right. And so we don't, we're not able, well, we could be, build instruments to perceive those things. That's true, but how do we even know what we're supposed to be detecting? That's true. This in, is true. In order to build those. Absolutely. Well, how did that come about? It came about because, like, wasn't, like, Newton working in some, uh, you know, who was it that was working in some, he was, he was building, like, mirrors or something, or prisms? He was like trying to like forge these things. He was terrible at it. I forgot his name. <laughs> but he basically it was like it was like up on like the shelf or whatever and he like saw the light going through it and then oh. it separated out all the different things and he was like, Ah oh, <laughs> look at that. I think it was Newton. I don't know. What, with the prism? Yeah, Optics? The yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's something for your phone to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um what's that time at? Um this is good. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed talking about all the stuff. Well, yeah, it's, we could get pretty deep. Um, <laughs> That's at one thirty-two. One thirty-two. Mm -hmm. So how are you feeling? Good. How about you? I'm feeling good. Yeah, I'm feeling good. <laughs> we good. can keep going. Whenever, whenever. Yeah, whatever works. Yeah. Do you want to do like another fifteen minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Sure. Okay. Um, so we're talking about. Um, life in the universe. <laughs> Do, talking about competing theories, like so. Like I said, what what did people believe before the Big Bang Theory? Like, you, we, we only know the Big Bang because that's what we grew up with. That's, mm. This is, you know, our current view. So what was the prevailing view of origin of the universe before? Um, who is it? Hubble, you know, that discovered, landmark discovered in Hoyle. And then, so that led to, you know, the development of, of Big Bang Theory. But before that, what was the prevailing view of how the universe came into being? I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Um, things like star formation and things like that. Yeah. God? <laughs> or is yeah. that always back? <laughs> so, <laughs> That's star. <laughs> so, so, right. So, we're, we're gaining this information from our, our elaborate, you know, Hubble Space Telescope. We have this great technology. And, but it's basically based off of our five perceptions that creates our reality. But then... Is that all there is? Is there something beyond our five senses that's, there's so much more? Well, I mean, now they're, now they're finding all the dark matter mm. or dark energy, or so they call it. Where they, they find don't know it? what it is. Well, I mean, I that's know. what they assume is there based on the... They say the vast but, amount of, of what they can't account for in the universe, there must be all this extra matter, and so they can't find it. They say well, it's dark matter. Well, it's because we're being pulled out. And the question is, the only force we know to to pull objects of mass is gravity. So Or it could be repulsive electromagnetic force pushing everything away. <laughs> static, you know. No. But I mean yeah. uh, negative static. Could you like let's say you had a giant electromagnet. Could you repel matter? 
<laughs> I mean, it would have to be magnetic for it to be pushed. If it had away. the opposite magnetic fields, it's going to repel. If it's the same, it's going to. No, opposites attract. But what do, am I saying? But, but if it's the same, it's going to repel. But do plan planets have that kind of? I know, like, there's, you know, um, what's it called? The core. There, yeah, there's like a, a magnetic mm -hmm. core, but like, is that would that be repelled there by like electromagnetic forces to the levels that would show the effect um, you're seeing? The gravity is the weakest force out of all of them. Um, electromagnetic force, but then the, there's the strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and then electromagnetic, and those are, those those three are way stronger than the force of gravity. Gravity is by far the weakest force. But it's the one that acts on the largest things, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, Earth revolving around the sun. There's no real other force that you see doing those kinds of things, you know, like in interacting with matter like that. But I mean, from the effects that they're seeing, also, the, you know, the same equations that are directing, like, you know, the interaction between matter and, you know, what we... I don't know, what we kind of call gravity. Like the estimations we do, the gravitational constant, all that type of stuff. Mm. And if you were to say like, oh, we're being pulled this way, how much of the mass, like let's say, can we not account for? Is this adding up to be aligned with this equation here? And it's like, oh, well, it is. Then what the hell is that? We know that's not matter. So what is it? And I think they just labeled it dark matter. Yeah. To say that we're expanding and being pulled out. Yeah, by something kind that's of on the like there's dark energy, dark matter. Yeah, it's true. Yep, it's kind of filling in the gaps for like what they think the prevailing equations and theories yeah. line up. It's kind of like yeah. how do you know a black hole is there? You no know black hole you is just, there by what's happening yeah. around the black hole. Yeah, yeah, that's you trace it. like the absence of it, and then you see like I don't know the emissions or whatever, and then you can like put see what is filling in the missing blank. Yeah, it's really cool from a statistics standpoint because mm -hmm. they. I saw the first episode of Numbers. Numbers is a great show. Everybody should watch it. I love it. Um, they, what show is this? You have to enlighten me. Um, oh, thanks. It's a show. It's a, it's a crime show. Yeah, yeah. But they solve the crimes using math. But it's not like... It's not like... A, CSI. No, it's not like baby math. It's like real math that you would do. No, it's okay. Sure. It's like it's like real math you would be doing because now looking back and watching the show and I'm looking at the stuff that they're doing I'm like wow that's kind of what you would use there like that's that's very right, plausible right. that you would use that mm -hmm. one of the things they used was uh, the first show was this serial rapist you know that was you know going around raping people obviously <laughs> but things they took into account about the crime scenes were how gruesome were the crimes that were, you know, committed and where were they happening? And can we come up with a probability density plot to find out mm -hmm. the areas of yeah, the no, city I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be more probable for this yeah. person? And what they found in the first one was was like, okay, we located the area roundabout of his home. So now matching it up with what descriptions have been, you know, said about the other crime scenes, like some people said, oh, I think I saw a van there or whatever. So they look for all these markers in the in the hot area. And then they didn't find anything there. So then another thing he thought of was like, all right, well, what if he has two places that he goes to all the time? And that made a lot of sense because, well, you have work and you have home, mm -hmm. two places you frequent often. So then they came up with a bivariate um, Gaussian plot uh density plot so they came up with two hot centers of where it could be and then they found out basically what linked these two areas together in terms mm -hmm. of addresses and codes and then they figured out where they were and then they went and stopped the guy <laughs> it was great that, though but they used it the, but they used the same sort of variables that you would use to estimate where a black hole is sure. by the effects that are happening around it Think about something more tangible. You know about like Brownian motion? Mm -hmm. What's Brownian motion? Brownian motion is like when things are, it's, 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 Einstein a, it's a fantastic was, process. It, yeah, Einstein, that's what he worked off of was Brownian motion, which is the random mm -hmm. sort of motion of like small particles. And you could see this with um, certain setups, like even on a microscope side, on the microscope, and you could actually sit there and watch Brownian motion, this random sort of motion of particles. 
can you apply statistics to that and to those particles and predict, oh, where's that particle going to move to, you know, in a temporal sequence? That would be pretty... Has anybody done that? I don't know. That, that might be a cool thing to pursue. Mm, I would say... Because Einstein was famous for, like, his his work, his early work on Brownie Mo and also photoelectric effect, you know? I would say you can predict it in the very near future, but no more than that. It's the same as predicting weather. You know, it's it's a stochastic process that you can maybe predict accurately very, very near, like, the next day. Yeah. But... As for predicting the trajectory, that's it's it's too complicated. Unless we have the alien technology, because then we can <laughs> uh, control the weather, right? And yeah. Engineer the weather. Right? Like do six machina. <laughs> What's that? It's just uh, use alien technology to solve all of our problems. Or, or create all our problems. It's, yeah, but I depends mean, uh, if the aliens have good or bad intent. That's true. That's true. Yeah. The the stock market follows similar kinds of processes like uh, Brownian motion. Yeah. A little bit more complicated stuff, but still a stochastic process for the prices. Mm. All interesting stuff. Yeah. Didn't Einstein devote like the rest of his life to alchemy? Or is that someone else? Gut. No, I mean, uh, uh, it was um, New theory. Newton that had, um, Newton had a, um, you know, followed alchemy, like mm -hmm. al alchemical, you know, text and things like that. So Einstein, after you know all this um, stuff on relativity, special relativity, mm -hmm. he was looking at grand unified theory, which is linking the big picture, the universe, which you know his model of you know special relativity works well with um, the minute, and that's where quantum mechanics and and talking about you know minute things, atoms and subatomic particles, how they function, and sort of linking, you know, the very, very big with the very, very small, uh, and sort of a grand unified theory of everything. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, most of his life was spent in frustration trying to, to work that that stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is crazy. I mean, they're still working that out with frustration. <laughs> yeah. And Newton, you know... I don't know if they're even looking at it anymore too much. Yeah. I mean, string theory, they're doing stuff with that. Wait, what's the But theory? they seem to be in another land... What's the theory where there's one particle on one side of the universe and it's twin particles? Entanglement. On the other? Entanglement oh. theory, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where well, one could um, affect, you know, distance is uh, irrelevant. Yeah. Str yeah, string theory is the theory that it's all these particles that we're seeing, it's sort of like you have this one string and it's twisted in a certain orientation and vibrates at a certain frequency. And now when you put in those two things together, it's meant to be some particle that's in our world that we it see. It manifests. So it's like the duality of, of light, like a photon could be considered a pot, uh, particle or a wave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you were to twist and it then, in right. a different way, it becomes a different particle. Right. Oh, wow. If you study it one way, it looks like it moves like a particle. If you study it another way, it's like a wave. Mm. I yeah. see why Celia wants to study astrophysics now. <laughs> Gets confusing. Yeah. <laughs> But Unless you think of a photon moving in, in um, a spiral, yeah. then at certain points you could see it as a particle, and, and it could also be considered like a wave. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's so, that's their kind know. of theory for string theory. But all of that is also on a complete I like spring theory. Foundation. Yeah, like little spring. Everything's <laughs> like a spiral spring. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's all that's all on a mathematical foundation right now. Mm -hmm. they, they can't really make any experiments to confirm whether or not that's true. Mm -hmm. You know? But, I mean, it seems to line up with some of the equations. Like, I think what happened was they realized if they, like, added one more dimension. Because Einstein said, let's do, you know, X, Y, Z. Right, right, right. Space right, coordinates, right. and let's add time. And then someone else added, like, I forget what the other variable was. Maybe, like, I don't know, gravity or whatever. Mm. And then when they did all the equations up there, they realized that when you reduced it and took out one of the variables, out popped, like, all of Einstein's equation if you took that out. Out pop like Newton's equations. Right, right. So right. they're like, oh, well, how high does it go Higher up? Higher structure. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I think they went up to like 11 or 12 dimensions. Yeah, that's yeah. where they get some of the prevailing theories. Mm -hmm. You know about like Monte Carlo simulations? Yeah, so there's, there's some correlation with that. And like as you go up in dimension, but then it all falls out after the fifth dimension or something like that. Like there's a good uh, correspondence, and then after the if you go higher than the fifth dimension, it kind of the bottom drops out or something. Yeah. So I don't quite understand all that. Too. I'm not explaining it. Properly, <laughs> I'm sure. Um. 
Yeah, I mean, from what I what I know about Monte Carlo simulation, I I don't know if that if it adds up to sort of the same thing. I know that they have a lot of links between. It's fascinating. They have a lot of links between those type of statistical like stochastic processes with you know that in physics, mm. but also economics too. Mm. Economics, it follows like the same like laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. They they seem to play some kind of role in economics when you're coming to like equilibrium and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. But yeah. yeah. All right, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, so we're at an hour 45. <laughs> That's cool. That was good. We could right. I, really, I really enjoyed this. Talk. Good. Yeah. We could talk for days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Yes, Thank you. For Anytime. Having. Sure, yeah. sure. So, wait, hold on. Should we pose a question to the audience? What would that Go be? You have. I don't have any question in mind. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to post the question. Yeah. If we questions. create um, a computer that can think for itself, like artificial intelligence, and this computer has the, or, you know, the technology has the capability to build itself. Then would that be considered a form of life, or can it be considered alien mm. life? Mm. That's a good one. Would that be a good question? To <laughs> that's pose? a great question. Now that's a question. We'll leave you off with that. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>